are moving on to the, the panel, and this panel is about CASPA and distributed consensus. My name is Elaine Shi. I'm a professor at Cornell, uh, and I'm uh, very honored to moderate this panel. We have four distinguished panelists, um, and I'm going to begin by having the panelists each, in, each spend two minutes to introduce themselves, and also um, um, maybe a short, concise statement or pitch that you would like to make regarding distributed consensus. Uh, and then I'm going to um, ask questions, and I'm going to open it up for the audience to ask questions. So because we have a big room, uh, for those of you who want to ask questions, I'm going to ask you to move to the front so everyone can hear you when you ask questions. OK, all right. Uh, let's maybe start from Vitalik. OK. okay. Um, so uh, hello, everyone. Um, who here does not know my name? <laughs> okay, I see some hands raised, good. Um, I'm Vitalik, uh, Chief Scientist of the Ethereum Foundation. Um, so earlier this morning, I, and I gave an introduction to um, it, basically what Ethereum is um, if, from a technical standpoint, but I also mentioned that and later today I'd be talking a bit more about some of the uh, projected things that we want to do in the future of Ethereum. And one of the big threads uh, that of uh, kind of research and developments that we have at the Ethereum Foundation is um, Casper. So um, Casper is this kind of category of proof of stake consensus protocols that we have been uh, thinking about and developing, researching over the last uh, few years that are kind of based around a couple of principles. Right? So one of them is um, obviously decentralization and Byzantine fault tolerance, which is really a synonym for decentralization because both words basically mean that one single guy can't screw up and, and, and break the whole thing. Um, then we also have this idea of economic security that I'm sure Vlad will talk about much more and you could really, really uh, credit him for kind of pushing hard on uh, putting that at the front of the agenda. So personally, I uh, have been spending my uh, time more specifically on uh, moving, pushing forward with uh, Casper the Friendly Finality Gadget or, or Casper FFG. So this is one, one of the two kind of algorithms in the Casper family. And the goal of Casper FFG is to be something that's as simple as possible and as simple to graft onto the existing proof of work chains as possible, while at the same time theoretically being a fully fledged and uh, provably safe, um, safe under asynchrony, a, a Byzantine fault tolerant consensus algorithm. So the idea is that it, re it takes sort of PBFT uh, like, like I, or uh, you know, Lamport's uh, Byzantine General's paper like ideas and basically translates them into a blockchain context and you know, like really simplifies them substantially to the point where, as uh, Chiang Wu showed earlier today, the kind of consensus rules slash condition fortress rules are fairly simple to implement. So the goal of Casper FFG is to basically be proof of stake that can be implemented fairly quickly, overlaid onto any proof of work chain today with an eye to in later stages of the roadmap, you know, like implementing more advanced things like full proof of stake, so getting, uh, getting rid of the proof of work completely, um, as well as you know, things like uh, some of the more advanced uh, features that Vlad wants to include. Yeah, uh, thank, thanks, thanks, for, thanks for the talk. Um, yeah, so I mean, I definitely you know, feel like the you know, proof of stake research that we've been doing over the, the years has like, you know, two kind of bifurcations, like the economic stuff and the consensus stuff. And, you know, they're really kind of, at the end of the day, end up being really tightly connected because the limit to our ability to incentivize the nodes is to infer the, what behavior they actually did. And the, lim and the limits there are actually limits to fault attribution. And that has to do with like the, really the mechanics of the protocol, right? Which is why we, need, we, we want not just to say, prove that it's fault tolerant, but prove that when there are faults, we can find them, right? So that we can penalize the faulty nodes. So that not only you know can we tolerate faults, but we also disincentivize them. So um, you know, and, and and I think that like the bo both sides of the research have kind of come a long way and actually feed into each other actually in a very kind of tight way. Um, to me, like today, the thing that's the most exciting to me is kind of the stuff that I kind of just showed, right? I like the fact that I think we can get like I mean I'm sure we can get. Um, asynchronous safety with any, like, a, you know, just like pick your fault tolerance threshold uh, with an overhead of Nakamoto consensus um, is, I think, really cool and uh, something that, you know, is 
uh, I think, new technology. Um, and I, I kind of want to echo what Vitalik said, that I think the simplicity of the protocol specification and the simplicity of the proofs is like kind of paramount to uh, our like design philosophy or our design goal. Uh, hello, I am Peter from uh, Parity Technologies. So um, at uh, uh, Parity, we've been implementing, uh, um, we've been working on consensus and, and uh, on, on implementation in particular of consensus for a while. And uh, we kind of taken a step-by-step -step approach. Um, now it's somewhat converging to, to a, lot of, uh, a lot of research that is uh, coming out, uh, but we started by s separating the uh, validator set, so um, the piece that decides who, who is the current set of validators, so when, if uh, it might be uh, determined by, the st by their stake or by support uh, of other parties, so that would be proof of authority, and then the, the consensus algorithm itself. Um, and then uh, we started off with a very um, kind of simple um, consensus algorithm that was based on a uh, uh, on basically issuing proposals in in a round. Uh, so um, it is somewhat similar to what what Vlad talked uh, uh, about at the end, uh, where where uh, validators uh, uh, kind of issue uh, blocks uh, um, uh, sequentially, and then. Um, then we added uh, uh, finality, so that was basically a, a module that then uh, looks at the, at the blockchain at any, at any particular point and sees uh, who signed off on, on which chain. And basically, if someone signed off on a chain, then, uh, then that contributes to finalizing that particular chain. And um, now I think um, um, we, um, the other things that, that will be interesting is introducing um, new message types. So, uh, enabling not only uh, validators to finalize blocks, not only by releasing blocks, but also releasing just simply statements of validity uh, of a particular chain, uh, act speeding up uh, how, uh, how fast the blocks can be finalized in these types of algorithms, and of course working more on the validator set, so more working more on the economic side uh, of those protocols. And um, yeah, the validator set as, as they are right now, they support uh, providing uh, misbehavior proofs, and those misbehavior proofs can depend on the type of consensus engine, so they might be double signing, and then the verification of the misbehavior proof uh, happens on chain, uh, and then slashing can be done based on that. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me here. My name is Emin gun -Sir. I'm a professor at Cornell University. I'm also a co-director at the Initiative for Cryptocurrencies and Smart Contracts. So um, uh, there are a couple of things that people should maybe know about me, but the most important one, um, beyond anything I've done in the past, like I, I did play a pretty you know, early role in cryptocurrencies in something called Karma in 2002, 2003. It was one of the first implemented uh, system with a proof of work uh, minting in it. Um, but uh, beyond that, I, you, so many of you know that I played a role in uh, anticipating the DAO hack and so forth. Um, but the most important thing, I think, is, is the following. It's, it's I think, why, partly why I'm so excited to be here. This is a very science-driven community, and in much of my work, what I really value is science-based design with strong guarantees. So this is a domain where there are many, 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 many reasonable-sounding protocols that anybody could just come up with at any one time. You know, I essentially reach into my gut and I give you something, oh, A sends a message to B, sends a message to C, then this happens and that happens. And there's been no shortage of white papers containing these kinds of what we call design by gut or uh, wishful thinking design or sunny day design. And um, those are fine, um, they might work. Uh, but as we often find out, the, the, the devil is in the details and uh, what you should all demand uh, as a community are actual hard proofs. Uh, with, in the absence of those proofs, these systems typically tend to falter. So um, uh, in, in every answer that I give to any question is colored by the science-driven design. I'm very much restricted in what I can say publicly and privately uh, because I, you know, I, I have to just say things that I know to be true. Um, that has allowed me to actually be very, tr very correct in, 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 in uh, you know, prescient in some ways, but it also means that, uh, uh, that I demand a higher bar for, for protocol design. Um, and I hope you will too. And, and I think what we're seeing happen uh, is Casper is gradually getting to the point where it's actually beginning to reach that bar. And uh, we're finally getting to the point where we understand the workings of the protocol better. And uh, we will hopefully soon have uh, something ready to roll out. 
Okay, well, thank you so much for the excellent statements. And I'm going to begin by asking a couple of questions. And um, uh, if you would like to ask a question, I'm going to ask you to maybe move to the front and at the yellow line. And then um, me will be able to um, pass you the mic. Okay, so my first question is regarding um, the debate between proof of work and proof of stake, right? So we all know proof of work is probably in the longer term, not what we want because of the enormous energy waste. Um, but there have been a lot of debates in the community um, about the security of proof of work versus the security of proof of stake. You know, some argue proof of work is more secure, others argue proof of stake is more secure. Uh, so for Ethereum, for instance, one um, reason why you guys are moving to proof of stake, I mean, obviously, other, other than the, the energy waste, you, are also, you also want to have an incentive compatible protocol. Um, but I, I wonder what you guys think of this question, like the security of proof of work versus proof of stake. In particular, Imagine I'm not a rational player. I just want to attack the system and break the consistency. Do you think like the proof of stake approach actually increases the cost of such an attack? Um, start? Yeah, sure, I would love to. Um, so firstly, I would say like, okay, proof of work is not asynchronously safe, right? Um, and it's one of the main differences actually between proof of stake and proof of work is that uh, in, in proof of stake, you can actually achieve like finality, right, uh, and like actually decisions that are not going to be reverted and that are safe in asynchrony. I think like that increases security a lot, and I think that uh, in terms of the 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 damage that an attack could do, the fact that blocks can't be reverted arbitrarily really mitigates that. And then and then additionally, the fact that when they do when the safety failure does happen, the faults are attributable and the nodes who attack can lose money means that the nodes who are attacking can operate at, will operate at a higher cost than nodes who are not attacking, which is like not, a, not the case in proof of work. So I think, you know, for those reasons and more, uh, like proof of stake is like going to be more expensive to attack and your attacks are going to be more limited. Yeah, so let's say that you are, just to be politically neutral, the government of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, and you want to uh, destroy basically take to, uh, destroy a proof of work blockchain, right? So what do you do? Step one, like one, you know, we could just imagine a very full direct attack, right? So you would get a billion dollars and, you know, okay, fine, some of your people can go without food, but you get a billion dollars and you buy a whole bunch of ASICs and then you just launch a 51% attack on the network. Now, what, I what are the developers going to do in response? Well, they have exactly one strategy, which is change the proof of work algorithm. So let's say they do that, right? So what happens? This is basically kind of literally the best possible counter move because if you don't do that, then they can do what's called a spawn camp attack, which is basically they just keep on attacking over and over again and they make your chain permanently useless. So you change the proof of work algorithm, which means the ASICs become useless, which means that you know, the uh, attacker has um, lost a billion dollars, but all of the good guy miners lost all, all of their money as well. Right, so that's one area where uh, proof of work already starts to show weakness because it means that if an attack is going to happen, then there's actually fairly little incentive to be on the, at the non-attacking side versus being on the attacking side. So then, okay, it's down to GPUs. Now, let's say you get another billion dollars and you basically corner the market on GPUs. Well, what is, okay, you, do, you launch another 51% attack. Now, this time, GPUs are general purpose hardware. And so the developers have no other counter move, right? Basically, step three of the game, and that's game over. You know, they can just, do, you know, the, um, you know, this uh, North Korean government could just keep on, you know, like doing a spawn camping, can keep on the censoring transactions, doing 51% attacks. You cannot change the proof of work algorithm again because if you change it again, then well, for the new algorithm, GPUs are going to work for it as well. So. This kind of puts a, a, an upper bound on basically the amount of damage that a proof of work chain can take, which basically means that a proof of work chain, has, in order to survive, has to make this cost of attack very high, which is basically this kind of doctrine of you know, like survival through, through domination and massive hash power. Now let's look at proof of stake. Okay, so you know, like Uncle Kim buys up $100 million of ether, then, you know, does it, okay, fine, you know, BFT, 34% uh, bounce, uh, so you can definitely launch a 34% attack or a 51% attack. So, okay, you launch an attack. And let's say this breaks finality or this censors transactions for a while. Well, 
guess what? The, the economics of Casper are designed in such a way that if you do this, then worst comes to worst, the community can coordinate a hard fork. So this is a totally legitimate move because you know, like even the proof of work people agree that changing the proof of work is a legitimate move to counter 51% attack, and that's also a hard fork. So the community does a hard fork to hard fork away from the attack. Now, the difference here is, first of all, the attacker actually does lose most or all, their, all, or all of the money they used to attack. And second, anyone who did not participate in the attack does not lose any money. So, okay, step two of the game. Basically, three days of chaos happen, the community recovers, there's a hard fork. Well, okay, buy up another $100 million, do another attack. Okay, three days of chaos, community recovers. Do another, buy up another $100 million of ether, do another attack. Well, soon enough, the community is going to realize that this is what's happening. Eventually, Uncle Kim is going to run out of money, and so they're just going to sit quietly, and people are going to start buying up ether, and each and every one of these attacks is going to keep increasing the price of ether, because it's basically taking $100 million of ether off the market each time and, and permanently destroying it. So eventually you run out of money and the community wins. Right? So this is kind of, like basically the, the moral of the story is that because in proof of stake, the staking coins are defined in, or the assets used to stake are defined inside the system, the result basically is that you can make these rules that you, know, you have a, a huge amount of flexibility to make these rules that are basically extremely lopsided in the defender's favor. And that basically means that you know, if, like, if the attacker has some amount of money, then they can basically break the system maximum a limited amount of times. Now, one really nice goal for this is, of course, to see if we can actually formally prove you know, like the balance on amount of money you have divided by the, you know, the number of times you can, break, you can force the community to hard fork, which would by itself be a very interesting challenge, but uh, at least that by itself shows the asymmetry. So uh, to pile on uh, the, uh, both Vlad and uh, Vitalik's responses, I think what's going on here is fairly straightforward. With proof of work, we're at the mercy of hardware trends. That's it. That's it. We're, the control of the security of the system is out of our hands. As uh, trends change, as people invent new technologies with, let's say, with uh, various uh, process level tricks to get to pack more transistors, to, to pack better hashers into the same die area, um, as people come up with better uh, heat cooling, etc., tricks, um, we're going to see hash power shift hands and we will have absolutely nothing in our hands, no knobs we can twist to control what happens. I think everything that you heard from Vitalik was exactly uh, fundamentally rooted at that cause. And with proof of stake, we have the ability to actually put independent individual knobs on each and every one of the participants in the system. This is huge. It gives us an additional multiple levels, multiple dimensions of control over the system. It also makes the problem much more difficult. Uh, that's why there are multiple Casper, there were multiple Casper variants. Uh, that's why it's actually hard to figure out exactly what you should do because the design space is so big. And, uh, and so if you could conquer the des design challenge, if you could come up with a protocol whose properties you can prove, then uh, the potential for having a secure protocol is much higher for proof of stake than for proof of work. Yeah, I think, uh, as was mentioned previously, with proof of stake, the, the distribution of, of control and uh, of, of uh, stakers can be much wider. So anyone that has any sort of use of the network can, uh, can submit a stake and, and in a way, uh, uh, be invested in the security of the network. And uh, there is much less overhead to, to hold any stake in the network rather than having to buy a miner and mine on the network or buying a share in a mining company, uh, it's a more, much more direct uh, connection to the protocol itself. Um, but then um, at, at the same time, I think um, uh, what, what the, what another problem that can arise is um, if we have many participants in the uh, consensus, um, it becomes very um, um, expensive to run the consensus process amongst many participants. So a lot of systems have something like a delegated proof of stake where only a few parties actually participate in consensus while everyone is kind of just delegating to someone else. And that can potentially lead to issues uh, with, uh, with very few parties kind of um, having uh, a lot of control over the network. So I think uh, an important thing that we'll need to think about is uh, how to kind of manage this balance between uh, distributing the power to every single person uh, that wants to have it and and, um, and 
uh, yeah, maintaining uh, security um, or ma being able to run this consensus in an efficient way. So just a really quick add-on. Um, even if the concentration of proof of work and proof of stake were the same, the fact that there's lower barriers of entry in proof of stake will mean that it behaves in a more competitive way. So even though I, I totally agree, I think like stake is going to be less concentrated than work, it's going to be more competitive even if it's the same concentration. Yeah, and because so, of the liquidity. Because of the lower barriers to entry. Yeah, lower barriers. Yes, I really liked your points. And let's take a question from the audience. Is there concern? Oh, cool. Um, is there concern for link rot with uh, a Casper implementation? What do you, uh, what do you mean by link rot? Yeah, uh, link, link rot, rot like um, uh, something maybe is uh, staked and in, in placed in the chain, uh, validated and placed in the chain, but the uh, uh, the chain that um, it's uh, 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 representing is is no longer exists after some time. Um, do you mean by exist? Do you mean can no longer be downloaded, or do you mean right? Yeah, yeah. Like some some of the the people who uh, were part of this this chain that was then uh, uh, used to be placed in the main chain that doesn't exist anymore, or the, the uh, users go offline. So you, you seem like you're describing a scheme that involves multiple chains, so is this like a question about sharding, or? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay, just to kind of uh, fast forward ahead about one hour before we fast uh, rewind back to here, I guess it, the answer is that there definitely is, are in general worries that if the, the system gets sharded to the point we are a very small number of nodes um, ends up uh, like storing each individual piece of data, then it is totally possible that some portions of the state could just end up getting lost. Now there are ways to make the protocol more capable of surviving that, and there are also ways of mitigating that, and, you could, you, and there are also ways of, of incentivizing storage, and there are, you could also just basically limit the sharding coefficients so that you still have, in like statistically speaking, like a few hundred people storing each piece of data so that it's safe enough, and this is a very active area of research. Thank you. Okay, we can take maybe one more question from the audience and hopefully I, I get to ask my last question. Um, okay, uh, here's a, a question sort of on the um, economic mechanics of between proof of work and proof of stake. So I mean obviously right now proof of work in, in Bitcoin for example or Ethereum is useless outside of Bitcoin and Ethereum. I mean, uh, you know, you're just doing a bunch of hashes or computing a hash over the DAG. But say if you had a proof of work like, you know, to try, like if you could somehow construct a proof of work that wasn't pre-minable, that solved an interesting problem like protein folding or traveling salesman. Um, then I think on, in, with proof of work you have this nice benefit that, nicer benefit, um, that you kind of lose in proof of stake that you can say look here we have Moore's law and, and uh, maximum processing power, sorry, the maximum manufacturing capacity in the world and say you know uh, in the next year like the hash rate could only grow up to this point, right? And if the hash rate grows beyond that point then the, or if like the price remains the same, and if the hash grain is beyond, beyond that point, uh, you know, it means that like the growth of the hash chain's power has uh, exceeded the Moore's law curve, so you know, like there has been more economic interest in the chain. Um, and you know, like you can actually, you can have like a total upper bound, like uh, if 100% of all, um, you know, new processors are end up being used to the further proof of work, obviously you can't have that because that makes less rest of society invaluable, and therefore, like, I mean, there's, there's a good balance there. There's like about, like, there's a parity balance there that you can count, compute. And in proof of stake, this isn't the case because, um, like, the proof of, yeah, like, say that we have, okay, 10% of ether can be staked at any one time or something like that. Um, the security of the chain from one, one to the, from one moment to the other really depends on, like, the chain's total value com uh, over, like, the ratio of that over uh, world's p uh, processing purchasing power parity, right, the world's GDP. Um, so if the world's GDP is way high, um, and the chain becomes much more valuable, like, uh, then, like, because it's like, like, the price is really a lagging indicator of that, um, somebody could come in and, like, uh, end up having a 51% attack on the chain, because it, or have disproportionate stake in the chain, because it would be valuable for them. And if they do, either way, like, also, if they do buy a lot of stake to do a 51% attack, they could short, right? Right before they do at the attack, which makes it cheaper or perhaps worthwhile. So how do you sort of balance, those, you know, like how do you see um, like doing the mechanism design so that you balance these incentives? Like people can't, that like you make it hard, like expensive to short right before doing, you do an attack and 
and like keep more uh, predictable bounds on like like the amount of con how the consensus behavior can change from one moment to the next. So let me let me tackle the first part of this question, which had to do with uh, useful proofs of work. So that's an idea that comes up all, all, you know, over and over again. I've seen it in many different forms. So first of all, coin designers of different kinds typically shun this idea for a very simple reason. Um, the, the main reason they cite is if it was the case that minting Bitcoin corresponded to doing you know, 50,000 protein folds, and, and we know the current cost of doing one protein fold on Amazon Turk or whatever, that would anchor the price of a Bitcoin. And people don't want that. They want it to go to the moon. And if it is the case that, uh, that a protein fold is five cents, then you are so you're stuck with a Bitcoin price being five times 50,000, five cents times 50,000, at least in pe people's minds. And that would create some kind of a price barrier. So you see coin designers shunning this idea. Uh, in response, academics have looked at this and they've come up with different ideas for using useful proofs of useful uh, uh, proofs of useful work, uh, using things like secure hardware to show that this person actually dedicated their CPU to doing something of importance to themselves, and it's up to you what that was. And uh, there's some interesting work coming out of academia on that front. Um, so that's, that maybe goes towards uh, addressing that issue. The second part of your question, I think, had to do with uh, what happens when somebody is shorting and attacking, and uh, anal analyzing those kinds of situations is always difficult. But uh, uh, you know, what, what can one do? Right? I, the, the, essentially, we can reason about coins in the system, and we can model the amount of damage one can do to the external value of the coin as well. And we haven't seen much analysis of that kind, but I hope that moving forward, we will see people take that into account. Because the coins, their number doesn't matter. What matters is the external market value. And in terms of uh, shorting, uh, if the value is going um, away completely, then, then you will not be able to close your short anyways. But um, in terms of like purchasing power, uh, this is something also something that, that in general grows. And uh, you know, we could argue that it might be growing at a similar pace to, to uh, advances in uh, um, computing hardware. Uh. Okay, let's uh, take one more question from the audience. Okay, um, just a quick question about economic finality. I mean, you mentioned that uh, an attacker might buy coins, might ether and launch an attack, and then the community might realize it's an attack and slash him and out fork and so on. But do you think that commitment to attack, yeah, I send uh, attack the first step, I redo my attack, I do it again, I do it again, I do it again. Some commitment to attack might be uh, community destroying and also might, for example, um, incentivize people to sell their coin and leave the protocol? Well, no, because um, like as I said, basically I, be I believe that if we can make Casper work well enough, then attacks will make the ether price go up. And so a commitment to attack will incentivize people to buy, buy, buy. Mm -hmm. That basically, uh, in, in my view, is kind of the, the sort of crypto economic holy grail. I'm, I'm, I, I mean, I, I agree with V here. I think, I think actually the question you're asking is, if someone commits hard enough to attacking, can they demoralize everyone and get, have them no longer believe the story that we will just sell the coins to the attacker at higher and higher prices, right? And the question, in like whether we're, people will be demoralized or not, is kind of really about you know their kind of states of knowledge and confidence in the the kind of belief that you can't conduct this attack, um, um, you know, over and over again if it costs you like a significant amount every time. And I think if people really believe that, then it shouldn't make you lose confidence. You should know that, okay, this is only gonna happen a finite and small number of times, uh, and therefore you won't just dump your coins in response of this fear of the persistent attack. So basically, you know, can a, someone commit to attacking the protocol and therefore demoralize the Ethereum community to the point where the price goes so low that, uh, that like it just gets, it, the security goes to zero? I mean, in theory, but I don't think it's very likely. Okay, we have time for one last question. One more question. Hey, uh, my understanding with Casper is that if I have been offline for a while and then I come back online, I need the Genesis block, a fork choice rule, and the current validator set. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about sort of the attack surface of that validator set being subjective and if there's ways to mitigate that with Casper when we switch over. But you only have 55 seconds. <laughs> 
Yeah, you, you don't use the Genesis block. You use something more recent. Yeah, like the I mean, the idea is right that there is this uh, kind of like a withdrawal uh, revert limit, and so like there might be some period, like say four months, and as long as you log in within that period of time, then you would authenticate the current state based on the information that you know, given the previous state that you were aware of at the last time when you logged off. So if you log on for a t if you log off for a too long period of time, then like it does become possible to make attacks where those attacks are not. Uh, Paid, like we are the, uh, those attacks uh, can happen without the attacker uh, paying penalties, but if you log on more frequently, then that does not happen. Okay, all right. So let's thank the panelists for an excellent panel, and thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jason Toich, introducing the TrueBit virtual machine. Thank you, panelists.